death of an individual, Robert England, by shooting Robert England with a firearm, and to then and there intentionally and knowingly cause the death of an individual, Armando Lazo, by shooting Armando Lazo with a firearm, and both murders were committed during the same criminal transaction. And the grand jurors do further present the said defendant did use and exhibit a deadly weapon to wit a firearm during the commission of the felony offense. Against the peace and dignity of the state, signed grand jury four person. To the allegation in the indictment, Mr. Villegas, do you wish to enter a plea of guilty or not guilty? <coughs> Absolutely not guilty, Your Honor. I need to hear it from the defendant. Not guilty, Your Honor. Very well. Mr. Montoya, Ms. Butterworth, you may proceed with the state's opening. Thank you, Judge State. community 25 years ago. The crime was different. The gang situation was different. It was bad. It was worse. And in this case, you're going to hear that uh, on Good Friday, April 9th of 1993, uh, there was a small house party on a street called Jamaica in northeast El Paso. And for those of you that aren't familiar about where Jamaica is, uh, it's a small residential street that comes directly off of Trans Mountain Loop 375. It's right in between uh, Kenworthy and Rushing. And it runs north of Loop 375. Um, so Loop 375, Jamaica, and Fairbanks runs on top of it. There was a small house party and four individuals, four young men, uh, went to this party. And it's Jesse Hernandez, Juan Medina, and the two decedents, Armando Lazo and Robert England. There were several people there at this house party. Uh, it ran into the early morning hours of Saturday, April 10th, shortly after midnight. You're going to hear that as the party was coming to an end and people started going home, uh, the, four men, the four men, the four boys, uh, Mr. Hernandez, Mr. Medina, Mr. Lazo, and Mr. England, uh, they were there waiting at the house. They were waiting for their ride to come and pick them up and take them home. And they were waiting, and they were waiting, and unfortunately, their ride, he didn't come. He didn't show up. And so what they decided to do was, we'll walk home. We'll walk home uh, along Trans Mountain to our houses. Everyone kind of lived there around Andres. And they decided, we'll walk along Trans Mountain because there's a lot of traffic. And hopefully, uh, if we get into any trouble, or if we get jumped, or if we get attacked, uh, people will see us. People will be able to driving by and they'll be able to stop us. And you're going to see that that shows, I mean, just, just kind of the mentality of having to walk along the, the street uh, because you're afraid of, of what might happen. You're going to hear that they started walking east on Trans Mountain and towards Russian. And as they're walking east on Trans Mountain, on the north side of Trans Mountain, walking east. Uh, a car is, drives by them slowly, and it stops. And they see this car, and they think, oh, maybe it's our friend who's, who's here to give us a ride. It looks like his car. It looks like a 1976 Monte Carlo. That looks like our friend. And so they walk up to the car, and then it drives away a little bit. Well, that's kind of weird. 
and they walk up to it again, and it drives away a little bit. And that happens two or three times. Obviously, they get upset, and they yell at the car, and it leaves. And they think that was weird, and they keep walking. Keep walking east on Trans Mountain. Finally, they get to the block, to the intersection of Trans Mountain and Electric. Uh, Mr. Spencer, you saw the map a little bit yesterday. It's a giant uh, El Paso Electric substation that's located on a dirt lot. The street's not called Electric anymore, now it's called Girl Scout. You're going to hear uh, that they wanted to continue northeast. They were going to cross the lot. Instead of going all the way around it, they were going to cross diagonally through the dirt lot. And as they're walking northeast through this dirt lot, they see that car again. Looks like the same car that, that was messing with them on Trans Mountain. And that car is heading north on electric, parallel with the same way that they're walking. And it stops, and it parks, and it turns its headlights off. You're going to hear that um, Lazo, Mr. Lazo, uh, and Bobby England, well, actually all of them, started walking towards the car to see who is it. Words were exchanged. They heard from the car, que putos. And then shots rang out. And everyone ran. The four of them ran. Drive-by shootings like this one are exceptionally hard to investigate. They're hard because the person shows up, the shooting happens, and they drive away with the murder weapon. They don't leave fingerprints, they don't leave DNA. Sometimes there's no witnesses. You're going to see that what makes this case particularly difficult is that the two surviving eyewitnesses, Mr. Medina and Mr. Hernandez, they were not able to see inside the car. It had tinted windows. They couldn't see how many people it was, who was inside of it. You're going to hear that both of them gave conflicting descriptions about the car. They gave different colors, different makes and models. You're going to hear that the only physical evidence left at the scene were the shell casings that were fired out of the gun. You're going to hear that all of the casings are 22 caliber, which is a pretty small gun. It's, it's not a large gun. It's a 22 caliber, and that all of the casings that were found were fired from the same gun, from one gun. You're going to hear that as of 2018, even to this day, that gun was never recovered. And that the casings were run through a bullet and firearm database uh, where, where firearms, bullets, and casings that are used in crimes are put into a national database to see, you know, are they related? Are they connected? You're going to hear that to this day, the casings that were found at the scene have never matched to any other crime scene, no other incidents. That gun has never been used in a crime that, that was then put in the database. And so you might be asking yourself, well, how, how do you solve a crime like this? How do you solve a crime like this? And really it comes down to the age, old, old age, the adage. People talk. People talk in the streets. They talk in their homes. They talk in their schools. And this case is no different. People start chit-chat, start talking. 
And what do the police do? They listen. They listen to the chit chat. They listen uh, to what's being said. And they follow up. And they follow the leads until they can't be followed anymore. And they have to sort through all of that noise, through all of that chit chat. And they have to separate the truth from the gossip, the rumor, and the hearsay. And in this case, once you've sifted through all that noise, there's one person's voice who is the loudest. One person's voice who is the clearest, and one person's voice who is the most consistent, again and again and again. And that person's voice is the defendant, Daniel Villegas. The reason why we are in this courtroom 25 years later, why you're sitting in this jury box, why he's sitting in that chair, is because of his own words. You're going to hear that he admitted to doing this shooting. He admitted to doing this capital murder again and again and again over a two-year time period from 1993 until at least 1995. You're going to hear that shortly after the shooting, a couple of days after the shooting, back in April of 1993, the defendant had a phone call with his cousin, David Ron Helm. It's about his same age. He told, and David Ronhell's going to tell you, Daniel Villegas told me he did the shooting. He told me he did it with his buddy Marcos Gonzalez and some other homeboys of his. David Ronhell was told this, and even the defendant admits, I told him this. But it, the defendant is going to say, as I anticipate, well, I was just joking. I was just messing around with my cousin. I didn't really mean it. I just wanted to scare him. David Ron Hell was so concerned, he did not think he was joking. David Ron Hell went to the police a week later to turn in and give a statement on the defendant. You're going to hear between the time that that phone call happened between the defendant and his cousin and the day that the defendant was arrested back in 1993, him and his buddy Marcos Gonzalez and Rodney Williams, they went to the mall. That, that's the thing that the teenagers do. They go to the mall, they hang out, and they talk to other teenagers that are there. You can hear that when they went to the mall, uh, there were some girls there. And the three of them, Daniel Villegas, Marcos Gonzalez, and Rodney Williams, that these three individuals walked up to this young ladies, a pair of young ladies. And the defendant told them, have you heard about the shooting this weekend? Did you hear about the shooting on Electric Street? I did it. He told them that. You're going to hear that he was arrested the next day based off of what David Runhell told the police. You're going to hear that when the defendant was locked up in pretrial custody, uh, he was in custody for about 100 days before he made bond and, and got out. You're going to hear that while he was in custody, he told someone uh, in the El Paso County Jail. I did the shooting. And he gave them details. You're going to hear that after he was released on bond, he told another friend of his, when asked, did you really do it? 
And the defendant says, yes, I did. That is why we're here today. Now, yesterday, I, I anticipate that throughout this trial, the defendant's going to say, or the defendant's going to argue, well, I made it up, or I was just joking, or I just was trying to be a tough guy. In all of these instances, and you saw Mr. Spencer yesterday in the jury selection, why would someone falsely confess? Do you remember that? Because how do you explain telling these people, I did it, over and over and over and over again. He has no one to blame but himself. I anticipate also that the defense is going to argue, well, there's other people. There's other people that said, or there was other leads that people were, were claiming credit for the shooting. That there was a lot of gossip and rumor and hearsay floating around in the time period uh, of 1993. And you're going to hear that the police followed up on each of these cases, on each of these leads. And they would dead end. And they would dead end. And they would dead end. And that the only place it didn't dead end is with this defendant. His own words condemn him, and it is on the basis of his own words that we are going to ask you to convict him. And I am, I am sure, I am confident that at the end of this trial, um, you are going to find the defendant guilty of capital murder of Armando Lazo and Bobby England. Thank you.